Thank you, uh, Tom. Congratulations on being the chairman as well of, uh, of RCS. So good afternoon, everyone, and welcome. On behalf of Sky, I'm delighted, really delighted, uh, along with my colleague and co-chair Gary Davey, to co-chair this year's Royal Television Society Cambridge Convention. As Tom said, the RTS provides a unique and vital service, supporting all of us in television. This event in particular, this I've been to this event many times now, has offered an important moment to celebrate some of our best work, to discuss the challenges we face, and to be inspired by the opportunities in front of us. And we look forward to delivering all of that to you over the course of this afternoon and the next two days. Now, it, feels, it doesn't feel as long, but Sky last hosted this event in 2007. How different the world was then. YouTube and Twitter were still toddlers. The first iPhone had just been released, and Britain's Got Talent was appearing in our living rooms for the very first time. This week, exactly 10 years ago, the British government was bailing out Northern Rock. The then Culture Secretary, James Purnell, was preparing to tackle digital switchover. And in Downing Street, we had a new Prime Minister contemplating an early election to firm up their grip on power. Whilst in the US, NBC was enjoying strong Thursday night ratings with a new reality show format called The Apprentice. Look where that ended. And of course, we were still a member of the EU. So in just 10 years, so much has changed. We've all lived through a dramatic shift in the role technology plays in our lives. The growth of the smartphone, ubiquitous connectivity, thank you, Tom, the rise of social media, and the power of data. Industries have collapsed and whole new ones have merged. Once famous brands have disappeared and new professions have been created. Back then, you could still buy DVDs at Woolworths or rent them from blockbusters, though, of course, not enough of us did. Airbnbs, Ubers, Deliveroo's didn't exist at all, and none of the 2.8 million apps, including the one for this year's convention, were yet available to download. Now, change isn't just something that happens to us. As an industry, we've innovated too, and often set the pace of change. Over that same period, we've created catch-up services, like the iPlayer, All4, or SkyGo, and we've transformed production and consumer quality with 4K. We've pioneered new services, like addressable advertising, and new immersive ways to experience video, such as virtual reality. Time and time again, the people and organizations in this room have led the way in using the power of technology to deliver even more and even better for our audiences. This convention provides us with a moment, we don't get many, a moment to pause and consider the changes taking place in the world around us, and also to identify the big opportunities for the future. Decisions like Brexit are undoubtedly adding uncertainty. There are real concerns about things like our ability to attract and retain global talent, continued access to other European markets, and the risks to the wider economy. These are issues that need addressing, and they will feature in our discussions over the next few days. However, change shouldn't be something that we fear. Change can also bring with it opportunity. So on this year's agenda, we've tried to balance reflections on the challenges of today with a space to also explore opportunities for the future. We tend to be optimistic because throughout all of this change, the one thing that's flourished is the value of high quality television of every type produced here in the UK. From tiny animation shops to major production houses, we lead the world in the creation of must-see television. Our creative industries are worth more than 80 billion pounds to the UK economy, and they're growing each year. To put that in perspective, that's more than a third larger than the entire value of UK tourism. And while there's more as we can do, as a sector, we already excel at exporting, as we'll hear from the brilliant international panel that Sophie Turner-Lang is chairing tomorrow. In fact, we're going to hear perspectives from around the world across the next two days, including Nancy Dubuc, James Murdoch, who are both US-based, Michelle Guthrie from Australia, and Rebecca Yang from China. As well as generating exports, this is a fast-moving and attractive sector to work in. Film, TV, and radio now employ almost a quarter of a million people. Creative quarters are emerging in cities across the UK attracting young talent 
and acting of drivers of growth and innovation. And we've all a proud tradition of putting back into our local community, although I think perhaps we don't all talk enough about that. Billions of pounds of real taxes paid, investment in the UK's social and physical infrastructure, and millions raised for charities, big and small. At a time when the UK's economy could use all the help on offer, it's a pretty healthy balance sheet. So what's working well? Well, we have to start with on-screen content, and my colleague Gary's gonna talk more about that in a moment. Whether it's Broadchurch, Riviera, MasterChef, Peppa Pig, or Love Island, the quality, originality, and diversity of the UK's creative content is the equal of anywhere in the world. There are few, if any, sectors in the UK where we not only hold our own with North America, but we're also successfully growing our exports to China, Japan, India, Australia, Brazil, and South Korea. Broadcasting mainly in English gives us a huge advantage. There's over 45 countries around the world where over half the population already speaks English. But it's estimated there's a further billion people, 13% of the whole world's population, currently learning to speak English right now. Just think about that. That's a potential whole new market. It doesn't exist today, twice the size of North America. As important, though, is the amazing TV talent that the UK is home to. Brilliant authors, playwrights, directors, and actors. But we also excel in the wider skills, whether that's in casting, set design, production managers, or technical directors. Not to mention first-class legal and finance teams without which no program would make it to air. We only have to look at some of the biggest global hits of the last year, whether Rogue One, Game of Thrones, or The Crown, to see how UK talent, including people in this room, are punching above their weight. As a country, we also benefit from a supportive policy framework and infrastructure, a great example of which was the financial incentive for high-end TV production. That's increased inward investment, supported British programming, and contributed significantly to the economy. And all of this rests on a set of UK institutions that form a perfect environment in which creativity can flourish. We're home to the most sought-after advertising agencies, trend-setting fashion designers, world-leading universities, Nobel Prize-winning cent prize centres of research, and the most vibrant arts and cultural scene anywhere on the planet. The organisations we all represent have contributed to and benefited a great deal from the creative strengths of the UK. In addition to brilliant content, our sector has also shown itself to be highly adaptable in the face of disruption and able to embrace new technology. It wasn't long ago people were predicting the rise of the smartphone would be the end of TV. In fact, the ubiquity of smartphone ownership has given us an amazing tool with which to deepen our engagement with audiences. Take that most traditional of pastimes, baking. Now, as well as being essential viewing in my household, during the first episode of this year's brand new series, the hashtag GGBO had over 280,000 mentions, proving that social media can be an essential companion to television viewing. And because of its talent and adaptability, our industry remains the beating heart of entertainment, telling the most talked about stories and as relevant today as it was 10 years ago. Lindsay will talk more about this, but in 2006, the average person in the UK spent three hours, 36 minutes watching TV. After that decade of profound technological revolution and transformation, the number today is just four minutes less. So today our industry is generally in good health, but this isn't grounds for complacency. Our task, the responsibility of all of us in this room, is not just to think about today, but to ensure that our industry can thrive and remain vibrant and successful for many years to come. The truth is that not every other industry has adapted to a changing world, and some of them have fallen by the wayside. Our duty is to make sure that that doesn't happen to us. So what do I think that means for the people in this room, for us? I think we need to work harder than ever to connect with audiences and ensure that we stay relevant. We need to be agile as some of our traditional sources of revenue undergo transformation. 
and we need to level the playing field that's unbalancing our industry. So let me take each of those in turn. One of our enduring strengths is our ability to make a real connection with our audiences or our customers. The trust that exists between ourselves and audiences is one of our core strengths, but it's something we can't take for granted. We must constantly challenge ourselves to see if we're meeting the expectations placed on us, and if there are gaps, addressing them. And if we're honest with ourselves, the EU referendum highlighted a blind spot in UK broadcasting. As a group, we failed to anticipate or to understand the result. And then, to prove it wasn't an accident, we did it again a year ago during the general election. I think what this tells us is perhaps we weren't as in touch with the mood of the country as we thought. We were too quick to accept received wisdom about what would happen, and arguably we did so because we weren't as representative of the makeup of the UK as we should be. We have to, all of us, work harder to get ourselves out of the London bubble, to give a voice to all audiences, wherever in the UK they, they may be. And we have to recruit, retain, and reward fairly the widest and most diverse range of talent. There are big questions that I expect we'll come back to a number of times. First, when we hear from the chairman of the BBC later today, in the session on news tomorrow morning, and in two important sessions on diversity and talent on Friday morning. Secondly, directly or indirectly, most of us in this room depend upon a healthy TV advertising market to pay for the content our audiences want. And for most of, it, most of us, that's already far broader than the traditional 30-second spot. As BCG argue in a wide-ranging piece of research conducted for this conference, online video advertising, dominated by just two global players, is experiencing explosive growth in the UK and may already be gaining greater than its fair share. It's opportunities for both sides to learn from each other. We, in television, can embrace data, introduce greater addressability, and be more adventurous in trying new business models. And if they're to build sustainable business models for the long term, digital advertisers would be wise to open up to third-party measurement, recognize that there is a deficit of trust, and to share the rewards more fairly with content creators. Again, these changes pose big questions, and we'll come back to this topic tomorrow in the session on advertising that Simon Pitts has expertly curated. Finally, ensuring our industry has a sustainable, even bright future also means addressing the imbalance that exists between our tightly regulated industry and the unregulated online world. If you think about it, in the UK, we have a very significant and established body of broadcasting measures. We've got rules around the protection of minors, limits on content that might cause undue offence, transparency of commercial, mes uh, commercial messaging, a ban on political advertising during elections, restriction on the impartiality of news, and protections for the prominence of PSBs. Yet in the last decade, we've seen a massive growth in the wholly unregulated online world, where there's no acknowledgement of, let alone adherence, to any of these obligations. Not so many years ago, these companies were small, probably lacked influence. Today, they're some of the largest companies on the planet with a reach and scale of financial resources far larger than everyone in this room combined. Yet they face none of the scrutiny or regulation that UK broadcasters meet. It's a lopsided contest, and left unchecked represents a real challenge. At best, our valued standards of content protection are being eroded, and at worst, fundamentally undermined. It's not about technology per se, as I've already said, technology has the power to transform the experience of our audiences, something we embrace and lead in. But instead, it's about the values that that technology is used to serve. As an industry, now is the time for all of us to make a strong case for action to policymakers to level the playing field so that we in broadcasting are able sustainably to promote the content and the values that the British public expect. As it happens, we have an excellent lineup of those responsible for policy, making and shaping policy, and so we look forward to hearing what the Secretary of State, the Chief Executive of Ofcom, and the Chairman of the Culture Select Committee have to say on this and other subjects over the next few days.
So as an industry, we've got a number of challenges ahead, but we face them from a position of strength, and I believe we're extraordinarily well-placed to make the most of the potential of the global market. We can't hide from change or uncertainty. It's only going to increase. Indeed, the pace of change will never again be as slow as it is now. This whole convention is designed to help us navigate this so we can find the world of opportunity beyond. Now, to kick off, I want to explore the current landscape with the help of three speakers. Lindsay Clay, CEO of Thinkbox, is going to demonstrate how television is still relevant today and how we're succeeding in reaching new audiences. We'll also hear from my colleague and co-chair, Gary Davey, who's in charge of content at Sky and whose 40-year career in the industry has seen him transform television across four continents. Gary will show why Britain is rightly regarded as a global hub for creative content. And now we're going to kick off with David Rowan. David was the founding editor-in-chief of tech magazine Wired. David spends most of his time hopping between research labs and startups to understand where technology is going to take business and culture. He's going to share with us his perspective of what the next wave of technological change may bring and the opportunities that could flow from it. So thank you, welcome to the convention, and please join me in welcoming to the stage David Rowan. Hello, nice to be here. Um, so I'm going to try and translate what I'm learning from the world of fast growth startups, the VCs, the research labs. I was at ETH in Zurich last week. I'm going to try and get their sense of how to make the most of the opportunity you have, but maybe the need to change some of the ways you operate to make the most out of where technology is going. Um, I was in Munich on Friday, and I ran, I ran into a YouTube star who makes videos about driving cars fast. His name is JP Kramer. He's actually had 400 million views and I said to him, OK, JP, I commissioned myself, actually. I commissioned myself with my iPhone. I said, OK, I'm about to go and meet you know, the creme de la creme of the broadcasting industry. You're a guy who's worked out how it's changing. What would you tell them? This is what JP has as a message for you. So you're now running one of the big TV networks. You have the budget that the BBC has, that Channel 4 has. Yes. What are you going to do with it? First of all, I don't think I will need that real big budget because what people really like in the moment, maybe it's a trend, is that people want entertainment that it looks real. Maybe some of the people from TV, they want big explosions here and something is falling down here and an airplane flies over the whole situation because it's big. I think that people don't want it and don't need it anymore. So they want authenticity. But some of these people have major successes on their hands. They have like nine or ten million people watching what they Who? do. Some of these TV networks. Do. Absolutely, they do. How many I do you have? I have 25 million every month, and I'm doing it just right out of my little workshop and office. How big is your team? Well, my team is now overall because you can make so much money in so many different ways. 50 people work for me now. I have 50 employees. And it is not really actually a small company, it's 4,800 square meters. But still, this all came not from TV, all this came from YouTube. Because I did TV, or I do TV now, eight years. Yeah. And the success you have by, just as a person, from TV compared to YouTube, really made a step of over 500% just by doing YouTube. And I will now stop doing TV because TV is old and I'm really not interested in doing it anymore. Because the main problem is, I can say that because it's not for Germany, the most people from TV, they want to keep the money. When you do YouTube, it's all yours. It's one man's view, you can challenge it. Um, but it's representative of a major shift that's happening everywhere with tech platforms, you know, musically has come from nowhere and huge numbers of people are swapping videos of lip syncing along to songs. In China in particular, um, the popularity of people broadcasting their day live and asking for tips has become so great that the government has banned the eating of bananas 
during these live broadcasts because um, let's say women are using it to flirt their way. I'm not going to show this. This is a family audience. <laughs> As Andrew said, the big tech companies are moving into their view of what television could be. Zuckerberg, actually, um, he's done a keynote recently at the developers conference F8 in which um, he thinks you don't actually need the physical box in the living room. We're sitting here and we want to play chess. Snap, here's a, a chess board and we can play together. Uh, you want to watch TV, we can put a digital TV on that wall and instead of being a piece of hardware, it's a $1 app instead of a $500 piece of equipment. And that $1 app, obviously, he wants to own. The places you can consume this amazing content that you're all creating, well, it's getting a bit messy. There are now sites just to tell you, if you're in a hurry, are you able to find something to stream? So um, my world, the world I got to know through Wired, is the people trying to disrupt you, trying to eat a bit of your lunch, trying to see opportunities based on people's behavior changing, but also new kind of business models. And I'm going to give a sense of what they're telling me about where they see this opportunity. Because I'm in a world where there are literally flying car companies getting funded. This is one in Germany that got $90 million a couple of weeks ago. It's called Lilium. This will be your taxi. And it's not the only one. There's another one in Germany called Volocopter. You can get to Heathrow Airport from the center of London in 10 minutes. The battery's only got about half an hour's worth of power. Um, but we are in the world of science fiction becoming just another consumer product. And I'm interested not in technology, but how technology changes culture and behavior. So drones are interesting to me, not because of drones, but because they create new kind of sports, drone racing. You wear the virtual reality goggles. You get the point of view of the front of the drone. Some of Andrew's colleagues in other bits of Sky have now paid for the rights to one of the drone racing leagues because this has come out of nowhere to become a sport. And I'm constantly having to rethink my assumptions of you know, what these guys like Elon are doing. Um, OK, so he's doing reusable rockets. And OK, he's doing some very cool cars. But actually, what's interesting are some of the new companies people like Elon are starting. He's just started a company that he's running called Neuralink that's trying to connect the brain directly to the machine so you don't need voice or fingers on keyboards. And there is a website for Neuralink, which he's funding. And the sorts of jobs they're recruiting on the home page of the website are fascinating. Mechatronics engineer, microfabrication engineer, medical device engineer. I don't know if it's scientifically possible, but companies like this are trying to create the brain to computer interface, which is going to change the rules yet again. So, the only certainty I'm seeing is that exponential curves, the doubling and doubling of progress keep on. And I keep seeing exponential curves everywhere, not just in storing data. I'm seeing them in you know, the price of Bitcoin. I'm seeing them in the, this is Bloomberg, the number of times companies in their quarterly earnings reports are mentioning artificial intelligence. Suddenly, every company has to be an AI company. I'm seeing them in the falling cost of things like sequencing human DNA on a logarithmic scale, something that was $100 million 15, 16 years ago is now a couple of hundred dollars, soon the price of a cup of coffee. This changes medicine. This also changes how the state tracks its citizens. And of course, it changes behavior, something that we couldn't have had because of exponential curves not inflecting till a couple of years ago and now mainstream. In 1994, Microsoft, which has a very nice research department around the corner, decided to solve voice. It wanted to teach the network how to understand human voice. The first year, it failed completely, 100% failure rate. By 2013, they'd got it down to 23% failure rate. Earlier this year, because of that Moore's Law curve, it was as good as human voice. And it's where it changes behavior. Now the expectation increasingly, especially for younger people, is, well, I need to talk to that device. Because we're not rational. Our behavior is a bit unpredictable. Somebody posted a question on the chat forum Reddit a couple of years ago. If somebody from the 1950s suddenly appeared today, what would be the hardest thing to explain to them about modern life? And my favorite answer was, I have a device in my pocket that's capable of accessing the entirety of information known to man, and I use it to look at pictures of cats and to get into arguments <laughs> with strangers. 
And I would argue that your viewers are not necessarily rational. You have to watch behavior. Technology leading to strange behavior has forced us to redraw Maslow's entire hierarchy of human needs. Um, so I'm going to answer or attempt to answer, based on talking to people, one question, which is, based on all the amazing assets you have that maybe you're not tapping in their entirety, what would the startups do if they had access to the resources you have? Um, and I'm going to give you five points. And the first one is the power of data to transform businesses. And I'm not sure that you are capturing all the data. I mean, we can talk about the internet of bums on seats watching screens. There are all sorts of signals that you could be capturing from the viewer's response. You could be personalizing a lot more of the programming because it's power. There was a company out of Tel Aviv that Facebook bought about four years ago called Anavo. You download the app. The promise was it will squeeze the bandwidth of everything you're doing online on your mobile phone so you'll save money on your data and it will send it via its own server so it will be much more private. Facebook buys it because they realized it gives them access to people's behavior on their mobile phones at scale so they can get early insights onto some of the bubbling under startups that are growing very fast. There was a company recently called House Party, a social network, that was booming. Facebook knew first and then starts replicating some of its models. They tried to buy them. When they couldn't, they just copied. Because through the data tracking of this stealth app called Anavo, they had access to this. There's a strangely high value company called WeWork that doesn't own buildings, but it rents out leased office space. It's been valued at more than $20 billion. What's very interesting is when they were asked by Back Channel, part of Wired recently, to account for that valuation, they explained, actually, the real value is in the data we're capturing about how people are working. We know, because we have offices all over the world, the optimal amount of space people need, what time of day they're busiest, how to design physical office space. They think the real value of WeWork is going to be in helping big companies, law firms, accounting firms, seat 500 people and save money on the real estate. So we're in a world where data gives hidden powers that maybe you haven't thought. I can name a whole bunch of tech companies that are now using the signals from your mobile phone, how many people you're texting, at what time of the day you're on calls, to see if you're a better credit risk. There are about 400 data points that one Hong Kong company called WeLend is tracking in real time. Even are you using the delete key whilst filling in the form about whether you're employed? All these things they can measure, which the algorithm can process. And I'll just give you one example. There's a company that recently got quite a lot of funding that uses satellites plus algorithms to count cars. And it sells this data at quite a nice profit to investors, to hedge funds. Why would it do this? Because it's counting retail car parks and comparing them with this time last week, this time last month, compared with similar size retail outlets, because it's getting access through that satellite and through the AI to data that those investors didn't previously had, which means way before the companies announce their sales, they have an advantage they can go to market with. They recently told their subscribers that um, an American retail chain, JCPenney, was in trouble. And in fact, the car count was nicely correlated with where the share price was going to go a couple of months later. JCPenney then announced they're going to close a whole bunch of stores. So don't forget the power of data that maybe you're not completely tapping. And the second buzz word that is, I'm afraid, going to be mainstream is, you know, whatever we call it, artificial intelligence, machine learning, the ability to create a responsive way of understanding what people want to consume, how they want stories to be told, is growing in all sorts of ways. In fact, we've just got um, this Chinese company, Baofeng, release what it called the first AI television that you talk to, and it responds in all sorts of other ways. I just give you a sense of how quickly AI, because 
it's being democratized, the cost of accessing very basic machine learning is falling, is going to hit all sorts of aspects of our life. Driving a car. So this is part of the keynote that a chip maker, NVIDIA, gave at the Consumer Electronics Show in January in Las Vegas. The artificial intelligence network, the deep learning network, just by studying her eyes, is able to figure out what direction she's gazing. Maybe she's um, looking at, uh-oh, no, shouldn't do that. Okay, so that's called gaze tracking. And this next one is really cool. This is inspired by, this is lip reading. Take me to Starbucks. And so if your car is too noisy, and there are too many people talking, and yet you said something rather important, wouldn't it be nice if the, your AI car was able to recognize and read your lips? So if your car can do that, damn. If I'm a director or producer of a program, I'd want that kind of feedback. So one of the things that we didn't think AI was gonna be very good at for a long time is understanding emotion. We're now at a stage where we're getting really good at using these tech tools to understand what people are feeling. So there are startups like Sitecore that can scan a crowd in real time. The little boxes don't just tell you the demography. This is a 35 to 40 year old Caucasian male. Um, it tells you degrees of emotional expression, degrees of sadness, of fear, of anger, of satisfaction. There are companies, this is beyond verbal, that can tell just by somebody's voice to the call center what their emotional state is. Apple bought a company called Emotiant that was tracking exactly how responsive your face was and signaling all sorts of emotions. So there's a lot of startups playing in this space. I don't know why, as a consumer of your programming, I can't express my emotion to that story so it can customize a response to me. Even Dolby is in on the game, although I think the Dolby way of doing this is probably not the way I want to sit and watch Game of Thrones. <laughs> it gets very interesting. There's a company in Auckland called Soul Machines. Mark Sagar behind it is an academic, but he was also part of the team that I think won an Oscar for Lord of the Rings. He makes CGI people, not videos of people. These are all computer generated. And he puts them in machines with webcams and microphones that can hear and can respond. So they can talk back to you. Yes. They can do it in different languages Bye. in real time as well. Goodbye. Willkommen in Deutschland. And he's selling the services to governments, to health services, so you can have a patient inquiry line, and it humanizes that interaction. You? It's a fascinating company. Go online, they've created a neural network to see how a baby would learn. It's called Baby X. And this is another of their characters. She even has the basics of a sense of humor. I've heard it's party central here. Have you got some painkillers for the hangovers? Yes, definitely. Good forward planning. And this place is filled with suits. Do you get an allergic reaction to ad execs? You bet. I personally recommend picking up some allergy pills just in case. <laughs> Stay safe But out it's there. responsive. It's listening and it's changing the narrative. So we are hitting the beginning of the mainstream of virtual reality plus augmented reality, increasingly being called mixed reality. Um, there was this little device that didn't get much coverage yesterday. But there are some very, very big funded companies in this space. Some of them may not make it. There's one called Magic Leap that's raised billions in funding and we still haven't seen a product, but it's put simulations online that show how it sees maybe the way we'll interact in the future. All via focusing light just above the eye in certain ways. <coughs> We don't know where it's going to go, but we know it's an opportunity to create a new sense of engagement. And then there's virtual reality. One of the companies leading the way creatively is called Within. This is one of its immersive virtual films taking you deep into nature. They also 
through the BBC studios allow you to be in space. There's a whole bunch of creativity that now has tools that can create a personal engaged journey. I think there's gonna be a more demand for this. And of course, it creates empathy like never before. Chris Milk, the founder of Within, among the other things he did was um, take you into a refugee camp in Jordan where Syrian 12-year-old refugees were living, playing football. You're in their world and you've got the ability to kind of walk through. There's no gap between you and the program maker. There's no gap between the stage and the audience. You are there immersed. Chris Milk calls it the last medium because there's no need to suspend disbelief. And so I'm seeing lots of this experimentation with 360 degree filmmaking. Keep experimenting because we don't yet know what people are gonna want, but we know the tools are gonna be democratized. And finally, I think this leads me to immersion in a more general way. I did a little experience where I was on the set of Ghostbusters shooting ghosts because I was wearing virtual reality glasses. I was wearing a haptic vest and I was carrying a, a rod that in my virtual world became a gun. It was an experience created by a company called The Void, which takes space in physical city centers, but it charges $30 for a 10 minute experience, which is a nice revenue earner considering how much we pay for cinema. And you can be anywhere and be on the set of Ghostbusters shooting the ghosts, because now we can suspend disbelief. Now. Your programming needs to be out there in the world. This is a comic con. This is just one example of how Westworld was turned into a physical place where you could go and interact with characters. Because it comes down to the power of the stories you're commissioning that we need. Because we are irrational. There's a company I got to know in Beijing earlier this year. Two-year-old company started making and distributing games and realized that's not what people wanted. They didn't want to play games, they wanted to watch other people play games. Esports. Esports has come out of nowhere. They've created a league where you can pay to watch other people play sports. They're creating 10 physical stadiums in cities across China to create a premier league of esports that will seat 2,000 people and you'll have IP, you'll have TV rights. Esports we wouldn't have understood just a couple of years ago, but got to go with people's behavior. And I'm gonna leave you with a, a little clip from a festival that's coming up in New York in a few weeks called The Future of Storytelling. Um, there's a filmmaker called Karen Palmer who has been experimenting with how you create a really immersive sense of developing a narrative with people. She wanted to, after Ferguson, simulate what it was like being in a riot. So her film is called Riot. So if you don't use technology, you are not allowing yourself to access a lot of young people in a language which they are excited about. Riot monitors three emotions, calm, anger, and fear. The webcam will be watching you as you are watching the film and determine the average of your emotions. So your eye tracking will determine your attention and your interest. And in that way, the narrative will respond and follow a character that you're interested in. So you are watching, in essence, a bespoke film that reflects your reality. Is this the future of television? No. Is this a future of television? Don't know, but it's interesting. I'm gonna give you one final word, which is, I guess, the risk of thinking it's gonna carry on as it has, because, well, that's just how we work and we have nice revenue coming through and still get 10 million people watching some of our great programming. Um, in the tech world, that's seen as an opportunity for outsiders to come along. In 2004, Fortune did a cover story about an Estonian and a Swede who created a business that was growing quite quickly called Skype. And inside, they quoted the head of tech for a telco, AT&T, who dismissed what they were doing as, it was like a toy. And then six years later, the New York Times did a big piece about this fast-growing company called Netflix, and they quoted the head of Time Warner, Jeff Fuchs, who said, well, it's like, is the Albanian army gonna take over the world? <laughs> I don't think so. Um, and it was almost exactly 10 years ago when this thing hit the market, and the head of a big tech company that was making 
smartphones, was interviewed on television about whether he saw this new iPhone as a threat, and this is what he said. <laughs> $500 fully subsidized with a plan? I said, that is the most expensive phone in the world, and it doesn't appeal to business customers because it doesn't have a keyboard, which makes it not a very good email machine. How did that work out, Steve Ballmer of Microsoft? Thank you for listening. David, thank you very much indeed for uh, what I'm sure you'll agree was a very thought-provoking, uh, sometimes challenging, sometimes uh, unsettling, um, but something there's a lot there that we can, uh, we can take away uh, and think about how to position our businesses for. Um, now, having exposed ourselves to the world of technology and Im an immersive world that David put in front of us, um, the, the second speaker for this session was... Um, going to move to the world of advertising brands and clients. So Lindsay Clay uh, is Chief Executive of Thinkbox, which works exclusively uh, with those audiences. Every day is out there talking to uh, people who are our customers, who are helping uh, fund our ecosystem. Uh, and I wanted Lindsay to share some of that, um, talk about how and we as a medium are viewed, uh, how we're positioned, uh, as well as some of the strengths of, of television uh, versus some of the other media. So please welcome to the stage, Lindsay Clay. Uh, brilliant. Thank you very much, Andrew. Uh, I don't know if you feel uh, excited by what you just saw, uh, depressed or slightly perplexed, or maybe a combination of uh, all three. Uh, thank you very much for having me. I've been to uh, uh, RTS Cambridge a number of years. Uh, this is the first time I've spoken, so that's fabulous. I'm very excited. Uh, thank you for having me. Um, and now, uh, there's another little theme going on as well, isn't there, which is I wonder if every single speaker today is going to mention Game of Thrones. Uh, I am the third. Uh, let's see if that continues all day. Um, what I'm going to ask you to do is a little bit of imagination today. So what I'd like you to do is imagine that the whole of the media world is Game of Thrones. Okay, now for some of you that's going to be easier than others because you may think that your day-to-day -day life is you are living at Game of Thrones. Uh, how many people watch Game of Thrones here? Most. Who's never watched an episode of Game of Thrones? Okay, that's about, oh, surprising number. Okay, uh, I will take it slowly then. Uh, so, uh, my argument for today is that uh, if the media world were Game of Thrones, then TV would be Jon Snow. Okay? And for those of you who don't watch uh, Game of Thrones, I'll explain a little bit about uh, what Jon Snow is all about. Jon Snow is the moral center of Game of Thrones. He's a character with incredible uh, integrity. Uh, everyone trusts him. Uh, he's also incredibly likable. So, uh, and he has the common touch. So he's popular with the wildings. He's popular uh, with royalty as well. He's a natural leader. You might almost say born to rule, but no spoilers. Uh, so he's a natural leader, but often a reluctant one. So he often doesn't accept that, um, you know, until he's pushed that uh, he should be in a leadership position. Uh, he's very quick to embrace the opportunities for new technology. He saw the whole dragon glass thing coming, didn't he? And he's, um, he's made a big uh, play for that. Uh, lots of people have tried to kill him. Lots of people have written him off. Uh, at one point, even they said he was dead. But, oh no, uh, he bounced back stronger than ever. Uh, so that is why, uh, you know, Jon Snow, I think, and, and the TV industry have big parallels. But if Jon Snow has all this going for him, then it raises one significant question, which is, why does he look so miserable? <laughs> so have you ever seen Jon Snow smile in, you know, in any episode? I don't think so. And I, I think there are parallels there with TV, because I go to lots of conferences, speak at, at, at lots of events, and quite often... People that work in the TV industry uh, tend to be, let's just say, uh, glass half empty. Uh, not always hugely positive. They'll be the first um, to hear uh, a presentation from a big tech company and get slightly depressed about it. So uh, my mission today is to uh, cheer up the Jon Snow faces in the TV audience, uh, and I'm going to give you some things to feel positive about. Okay, so first of all, uh, let's have a look at this incredible decade of disruption that we have uh, just had. Uh, Andrew mentioned this earlier, but actually, if you look at all the incredible disruptive technology that's happened in the last 10 years and that, then let's have a look at uh, standard bar viewing so viewing on a TV set within seven days uh, of the broadcast then that is what it looks like 
It's an incredibly stable picture. So it's gone from 3 hours 36 minutes to 3 hours 32 minutes. I mean, that's in incredibly surprising with a rise of on-demand and all those other uh, ways of watching TV and uh, other forms of high-quality uh, video content. But that is also not the whole story because, of course, there's a whole chunk of other TV that we're watching that is not included in the BARB standard measure. It's recorded by BARB and, and captured, but it's not included in that measure. So there's about another eight minutes of uh, viewing on the TV set, that might be uh, watching stuff beyond eight days, you might have recorded it and watched it beyond eight days or uh, on demand, um, it might be box sets on, on TV sets, and then there's another four minutes on additional devices. So for all individuals, that's another 6% of TV viewing that we're just not really, it's almost like we're not counting it. For younger people, for younger audiences, that's another 13% of viewing. So there's a bigger chunk of younger people's viewing which is not uh, being you know, pr properly uh, captured and reported, I suppose. So, um, back to the John Snow face. So let's have a, a look at young people's viewing for a bit. And I was really struck on the pessimism of the people in the TV industry. I don't know who went to Edinburgh this year, but I always try and go. It's a fantastic event. And I went to the, it turned up to the first uh, session on the very first morning, nine o'clock in the morning on the Wednesday. And it was, uh, it was this session. And really the session was about the completely smash hit that was Love Island and how, um, you know, Young people were practically clawing each other's eyes out to watch it. And yet, this session was called, Nothing Will Be Televised, Have Young People Switched Off? And then it went on to say, you know, this is, this is terrible. What are we as an industry going to have to do about it? And um, I remember a journalist uh, saying to me years ago that if ever there is a headline which has a question mark at the end of it, the answer is always no. So, and the reason they express it as a question is because, because it's not a fact. If it were a fact, it wouldn't be a question, would it? It would be young people have switched off. But no, they, uh, it's, it's not true. The answer is going to be no, so they uh, do it as a question. Uh, so um, let's, uh, let's just look at young people's viewing um, and let's look at it in the context of the whole of the video world because, of course, they're watching all sorts of different forms of video, not just TV. Uh, so what I'm going to uh, share with you is our entire video day, the percentage of time we're spending watching different forms of video, uh, including TV. Uh, and you'll see all individuals around the outside and then 16 to 24s on a little circle in the middle. So first of all, let's look at the online video world. This is how much we are spending on different forms of online video. You can see there that YouTube, uh, the, the um, big blue box for young people, significantly more time than for all individuals. Uh, that is YouTube, video on Facebook, relatively small. Um, Although we spend lots of time on Facebook, you're not spending much time watching uh, video because you're mainly just scrolling silently down your newsfeed. Uh, other online video, and of course, the all important porn, a very important part of uh, online video. Uh, next up, cinema, tiny sliver, very significant, but we just don't spend very much time doing it, and we don't go very often. Uh, next up, subscription VOD and DVDs, and they sort of go together, and we've seen those two almost reverse each other in time terms over the last year or so. Um, look how big DVDs still are, though, for young people. It's still, you know, more than 5% of their overall video viewing a day is DVDs. Uh, and, uh, you know, subscription VOD, more for younger people uh, than the average. Now, let's look at the whole of the TV universe. So that is what it looks like. So on our average day, three quarters of the time we're spending with video is spent with TV. And not just live TV, that's a big red chunk, but um, playback TV, TV recorded and watched, and then on demand as well. But look what it is for young people. And this is why it's so frustrating when people, you go to conferences and people say, oh, young people aren't watching TV anymore. Live TV is young people's most popular form of video. That is what they like to do best, more than any other form of video. So uh, uh, t tell, tell them that next time you uh, go to one of those conferences. Uh, let's have a look at that, that, that video chart stretched back over a number of years, and that's what it looks like. Now, at a glance, what you can see from there is clearly we've got a much more diverse video diet than we had, say, 10 years ago, and it looks like also live TV is declining. Um, but just um, that is not the whole picture. So if we just um, take a, a line and you start it from uh, what TV used to be in uh, 2004, the total of what TV used to be, and extend that line out, it is still the same as what TV is today. It's just TV is different today because it's made up of more playback and on-demand. Uh, you know, we've got the facility to do that now and we use it, but we're not using it exclusively. Live TV is still the most important. And then if you take a second line, uh, which is the additional 
chunk of high quality, really you know, premium um, film and TV content, which we used to watch with our DVD, Blu-ray and VHS, and you extend that line, and again, it's in the same place. So it feels like our, you know, the need to watch this stuff is the same, it's just that we're getting it by um, slightly different means. And I think what that shows as well is that all the online video is additive to the TV that we're watching. Okay, uh, let's uh, spend a, a little bit of time looking at young people and how their viewing changes as they get older. There's much discussion about this audience. Is it a cohort effect? Is there something different about this cohort of young people that means uh, viewing is going to uh, change dramatically uh, forever? Or is it a life stage effect? You know, will their uh, viewing revert to uh, what uh, other individuals have already done? So this is an interesting uh, piece from the I, uh, from, um, IPA Touchpoint study, which is single source um, data. Uh, looking looking at media behavior of uh, different groups. And I've taken the millennial cohort, which is sort of more or less 16 to 34, and divided it up into different life stages. Uh, younger end in red, uh, older end millennials in orange, and then um, older millennials with kids. And you can see that as they get older and have kids, they watch more TV on a TV set. They watch more or less the same amount of broadcast of VOD. Uh, they watch less subscription VOD and much less online video. So, you know, there's no saying, we don't know what's going to happen in the future. There's no saying that that, um, you know, young people are going to be identical to what previous generations are. I think that's pretty unlikely. But it does give you um, an indication that life stage will continue to be a significant driver of uh, people's behavior. Okay, a couple of slides just on TV advertising. That's the thing that um, I uh, spend my life uh, immersed in. Um, and however many major studies you do, looking at TV uh, advertising, always it comes out as the most effective medium. Uh, and you know, whether that was five years ago, whether it's you know, brand new data from today, that continues to be the case. And I'll just show you this, show you uh, this one chart. Um, there's a very complicated axis up the left-hand side, the increase in the average number of very large business effects. If you just take that as a proxy for general effectiveness, and what this is looking at is a very uh, large data set of highly effective advertising campaigns, and what is the impact on effectiveness of adding each of those individual media. So, um, if you added cinema advertising to your campaign, you could expect a 2% increase in effectiveness. If you add online media, the thing that you know, uh, everybody's investing like mad in, you get a 7% increase in your effectiveness. If you add TV to a campaign, you get a dramatic uh, increase in your overall effectiveness. And this is why TV remains such a fundamentally important part for any uh, significant advertiser. It's just absolutely the thing that is uh, going to make them uh, successful. And of course, that's very important for TV because it's the, it, one of the um, um, big contributors to funding content. So that is um, effectiveness, but also it's worth looking at viewers' attitudes to advertising as well. So uh, this was a question uh, from Ipsos, uh, in which, if any of the following places, are you most likely to find advertising that you trust? See how different TV is from almost every other media. Uh, it is absolutely uh, dramatically different. So, you know, 42% of people would uh, uh, answer that question positively. And I think the point of this is that uh, it's important to distinguish between the popularity and, uh, you know, the popularity and apparent success of a particular platform and the popularity and success of the advertising in that platform, because the two things are not necessarily the case. They're not necessarily the same. They are in TV, and uh, they're not necessarily in other platforms. So, um, which leaves us, uh, final question, so why is TV so resilient? You know, why does it year after year, in spite of this incredible change, continue to be so uh, effective and powerful? Well, I think there's, there's probably three points worth making. The um, first one is that um, TV has not just survived uh, in, these, in this uh, time of disruption, but it has thrived on new technologies. It's been quick to spot the opportunity. It has served its viewers incredibly well. It's brought um, you know, on demand in all sorts of different ways to viewers' lifestyles. And this is, these are just a snapshot of pictures of a piece of research we did uh, called Screen Life, asking viewers to tell us about um, you know, how TV was fitting around their lives. And uh, it, it, was a, it was a fantastic piece of research and fantastic 
fantastically interesting to see it, to see how TV is wrapping itself around their lives, how they're taking it on their commute, how it's solving um, different um, problems for, the, for them. Um, just on the top right, second from the top over there, that guy's not driving and watching TV, I promise, although it looks like it. He is actually a salesman, and he's stopped uh, between sales calls, and he's hooked his tablet into the sun visor of his car just so that he can catch up on his telly. But, you know, it's amazing to think all the things that you can do now that you wouldn't even have dreamt of 10 years ago. So, you know, if I've forgotten to record something when I'm out and about on my um, Skybox at home, I can just press a button on my phone and do it. I can download TV and take it on holiday with me. I can stream um, the sports match live on my device if I want to. Uh, I can start watching a program on a particular device and then, you know, uh, go, out the, go out the home, uh, watch it, continue watching it on another device, and uh, I can uh, do it without losing my place. So, you know, it has been an incredible time uh, of uh, positivity uh, for viewers. The second, and I suppose the most important thing, of course, is the quality and variety of programming content. You know, thanks to a lot of the people sitting in this room, um, it has never been a better time to be a TV viewer. They are incredibly well served. We're in this amazing golden age of uh, TV content, um, and uh, that is fantastic. But the other thing that is worth mentioning is sociability. And you know, going back to that point about uh, Maslow's hierarchy of needs, we are, um, we are uh, human animals that want to share experiences. We want to spend time together, we want to talk about them, and that is one of the uh, reasons why uh, both the schedule and live TV remain so very significant in people's lives, because people like to share them. So just under um, half of, of TV is watched uh, with somebody else in the room, and that rises to 60% in shared households. So, you know, that is a very important driver. And uh, that need to share and communicate is not the only need that is served by TV. Uh, again, this is from our uh, Screen Life research. It basically says there's a whole range of different needs which TV serves brilliantly and continues to do so. And I think that often, when people make, um, you know, people are always making uh, predictions about, you know, what's going to happen in the future, and in particular, what's going to happen in TV. And I think often when they get it wrong, it's because they let their excitement about the possibilities of technology eclipse their understanding of the fundamentals of human behaviour. Uh, TV uh, serves all these needs brilliantly, and will continue to do so. So um, I hope that uh, I hope I have managed to convince you that uh, uh, TV is fighting fit, just like Jon Snow. It is liked, it is trusted, and it is ready to uh, counter any of the attacks coming in the future. Uh, so it doesn't seem to have brought a smile to Jon Snow's face, but hopefully it has to yours. Thank you very much. Thanks very much. I think you'll all agree there were a couple of really great presentations. So I'm Gary Davey. Um, I love the theme of world of opportunity that we've adopted for the show this year because uh, I want to talk about what I think is one particular very big opportunity for all of us. I also want to talk about some of the new responsibilities that are now emerging for all of us as an industry. But above all, what I really want to do is to celebrate content. Now, um, uh, if I may, uh, it's uh, my first Cambridge, and um, when I first came to London in the mid-80s to launch Sky Channel, uh, I never imagined that I would be here, let alone co-chairing the event. But it's lovely to be here, and thank you. And I'd like to thank all of the people who have so kindly helped Andrew and I, uh, certainly Teresa, Helen, and Lucy, and also the 30 members of the committee that were behind all of the work to make this happen. So thank you for that. Um, look, as, as a rule, um, we're not very big on nostalgia, typically. Uh, but if I may, I'd like to take you back ever so briefly to the mid-80s and just bear with me, this won't take long. Uh, and in particular, what I wanted to do was to talk a little bit about 1985. Uh, the reason that that year is particularly relevant is four extraordinarily important things happened that year. Um, the first one was News Corp acquired the Metro Media TV station group in America. Five uh, local TV stations in five of the biggest markets in the US. Followed very shortly after with the acquisition of 20th Century Fox, which led inevitably, as you'd expect, to the creation of the Fox Network. 
Now, this was, 1985 was at a time when the world was ruled by NBC, CBS, and ABC. Uh, and the prevailing wisdom at the time was, well, we've already got plenty of TV. Why on earth would we want a fourth network? Which I guess was the question that everybody was asking at the time. But the impatience of a company like ours was like, well, surely it's an opportunity. And I'll come back to that a little later. The, the, the thing that happened simultaneously uh, was I launched that brand in the UK in 1985. That's actually the original logo artwork, which I found in the archives not long ago. Um, and if you think about it, 1985, Channel 4 was three years old. Channel 5 was coming 12 years later. I met a lot of people who used to refer to ITV as the other side. I, I'm sure there are grandmothers who still talk like that. There was the BBC and the other side. Um, and people used to talk about Britain having the best television in the world. Would people watch too much television already? Why would anybody possibly want any more television? And of course, you can imagine what that stimulated amongst our culture. So that was 1985. The, the, the next thing that happened in 1985 was this. Um, it was WrestleMania 1. Uh, and for the avoidance of any doubt, that's me on the left. Um, and WrestleMania 1 was the first big live event on Sky Channel. Uh, of course, it's now become one of the world's most profitable and successful pay pay-per-view events in the 32 years hence. So, a lot's happened in 32 years, as, as we all know. Um, so, enough of the nostalgia, let's talk about the future. And let's talk about some of the things that we need to do as an industry. First of all, I should say that... Um, it's clear to me that the industry worldwide, and in the UK in particular, is undergoing a genuine creative renaissance. Uh, and that, for me, is going to keep driving our businesses in all of the right directions, in spite of all the predictions of the doomsayers who've been de de predicting our demise for a very long time. I attended my first media convergence convention in New York 30 years ago. That was the first time I heard about the impending death of linear TV. And of course, we've all heard it every year since. Uh, but that first conference I went to, why, by the way, was hosted by Lehman Brothers. <laughs> Don't need to say any more. So not only have we survived, I think um, what is important is that we've not only embraced technology, but the UK, I think, has not only kept up with, but in many, many respects, stayed ahead of the important technology curves that are important to us. And what are they? They're the technology curves that help us serve our customers. And if I try to quantify the scale of where we've gotten to, if you just look at the, say it's Sky UK alone, this year we will deliver across our platforms nine exabytes of data. Now, that is at number nine with 18 zeros. Now, that is the equivalent of 117,000 years of high-definition video. Or, if it were text, it's 51 times the entire writings of humankind. It's a lot of data. But anyway, I'm not here to talk about technology because, as all my colleagues know, as soon as I go anywhere near it, I break it. Uh, so we're here to talk about content. And as you can probably tell, I'm Australian, uh, and I've worked in a lot of different television markets around the world. Uh, in fact, this is the first time in 20 years in my current role that I'm actually working in my native language, uh, which is really exciting. Um, but nonetheless, it's given me an opportunity to see a lot of television in, in the world, and there's no question that today Britain has the most diverse, most energised and most creative television output anywhere in the world. And that is something that a lot of people are surprised when I hear, they hear me say that. And uh, when I talk about diversity, I mean all kinds of social diversity, inclusiveness and so on. We as an industry have got a lot of work to do on that. Uh, we all want to make it better. 
Uh, I'd encourage us all to support the Creative Diversity Network and the Diamond Program. Uh, we all need to push ourselves, our teams, our independent producers to proactively participate in a program like that because diversity is a very big issue for all of us. But the other diversity about the diversity of creativity, I think, is something that we've done brilliantly. And if you think about the output currently, where we can go from Goggle Box to Downton Abbey, from Night Manager to Love Island, from Taboo to Strictly, uh, and even without the, the, the very sad passing of the great Bruce Forsyth. And then, of course, Bake Off, which has made such a spectacular journey to Channel 4. Uh, and I would take the opportunity to congratulate Jay and Love Productions and everybody involved in that extraordinary project. Well done. Um, so I think we're doing some great stuff. There's a lot of brilliant television going on all over the world. What I want to do is to just give you a glimpse of what our public are currently watching. So apologies if I've missed out anybody's favourite TV show. And yes, there's some Game of Thrones in this. Uh, but let's have a look at this reel. You stand in the presence of Daenerys Stormborn of House Targaryen, rightful heir to the Iron Throne, rightful queen of the Andals and the First Men, protector of the Seven Kingdoms, the mother of dragons, the Khaleesi of the Great Grass Sea, the Unburnt, the Breaker of Chains. This is Jon Snow. Shall we make a start? You ready for this? On your marks. Let the games begin. Watch this. <laughs> It's like a dream. I know. I'm incredibly handsome. Very fit. You know, it is possible that you might enjoy it. I still get a bit of a tingle when I think about it. It's all right. We expect perfection. No pressure. Awesome. I know. They're not looking for a story that tells them who they are. They already know who they are. They're here because they want a glimpse of who they could be. What the fuck is that? Spanish internet. We have Wi-Fi in Spain. <laughs> no, you don't. How much more proof do you people need? We want to be motherfucking taken serious. I have been powerless to do anything because you lot didn't want to know. Why did you choose me? Our revolution is coming. I think there may be something wrong with this world. Something hiding underneath. All right. It's invasion. The politics. They don't return for the obvious things we do, the garish things. They come back because of the subtleties, the details. They come back because they discover something they imagine no one had ever noticed before. Something they fall in love with. They only wanted to make the world better. Better. Better never means better for everyone. To the breach, dear friends, once more! Yay. That is pure. Wow. This is the new world. And in this world, you can be whoever the fuck you want. Not bad, but it's not enough and it's not good enough. Take it from somebody who's forever impatient about these things. So we're at a very interesting moment where there are different views about where this all goes from here. Um, my wonderful colleague, John Landgraf from FX Networks in the States, very famously got a lot of attention a year ago when he said that he felt that drama had reached a peak and that we had already reached a point where there was too much production going on in drama. Uh, I think there are 460 drama productions in production right now. 
Now, I don't agree with John, admire the man enormously, but I disagree with him. In fact, I found myself agreeing with Ted Sarandos from Netflix, who said, how can it be wrong to give somebody too much of a good thing? And I kind of agree with that idea. So the industry's in a really great creative position, uh, further to the comments that Andrew was making at the beginning about the extraordinary depth of the talent pool on, in all of the crafts and all of the trades in, in our industry. The two other points that I would make too is I think we're blessed with an extraordinary pool of on-camera talent in both the TV and film industries. But there's another point that I think we, we benefit from and that is over the years the industry's done an extraordinary job of encouraging the audience into a broad taste. Uh, this country has encouraged risk and, and, and developed an audience behaviour that actually accepts risk. That's not true everywhere. In fact, in a lot of places, and I think this is true in the United States, in network television, risk gets punished. That's something that we really need to hang on to and develop because as long as we keep taking risks, we will survive. That's our real advantage, is the behaviour of our audience. So it all represents a big opportunity, but I wanted to make the point too that I think this is relatively a recent thing, but there are new responsibilities emerging very quickly. Uh, we live today in a very divided, polarised world. Our news departments in the past year have been enormously challenged, not only in the things that they've had to cover, but the way they've had to interpret and analyse those events all the terrorist attacks, all the tensions around Brexit, the US presidential election, and the baffling UK election and what the outcomes of that mean. Uh, these are all really difficult is issues. And behind it all, there is clearly a sense of mistrust among the people. Uh, it seems to me to be very clear. People are abandoning the establishment and are losing faith in institutions. The reason I raised this is because it came to a really screeching clarity to me uh, in London uh, uh, in the events around the Grenfell Tower fire. Not only did society let those people down in the years leading up to that horrible event, but even in the days immediately after, the survivors of that horrible incident were sleeping on the street so badly had the institutions failed them. So is it any wonder that people are losing faith in the systems and losing faith in all of the institutions? My message behind all of this is we must not let that happen to us. We have to lean into the ordinary people of this country and make sure that they don't lose faith in us. Now, the next thing I wanted to point out was this whole idea of trust is something that's part of our uh, daily lives uh, at Sky. If you just bear with me for a minute, I just have to go and get something because I just wanted to prove that this is not a piece of Photoshop. This is here somewhere. Excuse me, sorry. Uh, this thing has actually existed in my life for a very long time. Uh, and it actually re represents the core principles of our company. Um, content, service and innovation are so integral to our business. If you take one of those legs away, any one of them, uh, the whole idea becomes dysfunctional. Uh, and the reason I raise it is I think we all need to start thinking about it in, quite, in, in that way using technology to innovate and marrying that to our content in a way where they're, they're not two ideas, they're one idea. And then provide service to the public and be authentic and engaged with the public in such a way that this is one idea. They're the core principles of our company. And I keep reminding my team that our biggest responsibility is the fact that for 28 years, millions of families have given us permission to take money from their bank accounts. And that is built on trust, and we must never endanger that trust. 
I would encourage us all to work on trust as a really big objective for the future because all of our outcomes will be determined by that. We need to differentiate, for example, from all of the new competition, whoever it is, by understanding the ordinary people, by understanding our local markets, to getting ourselves outside the London bubble, building real communities, in the work that we do, and probably most importantly, to give people the hope of belonging to something meaningful. Thank you very much.